Thank you, friends. So when I ask myself what it means to be a Quaker, why I am a Quaker, then I often start with the idea of uncertainty. For me, meeting for worship provides a space within which I can be uncertain, a space within which I can explore thoughts and ideas. My faith is built on exploring doubt. So I look to explore the testimonies, to turn them over, to pull them apart, to study them, to understand what they mean. Tonight I want to think out loud about equality, because I think it's equality which people use the same word and mean something different. We feel that it's a straightforward concept. We hear about equality in political discussions, discussed alongside freedom and self-determination. We hear about how we all live in an equal world where we're considered on our merits as individuals, and yet people march in protest of policies which seem to decrease equality. And every day on the news, someone somewhere seems to be saying something negative about an entire community somewhere else. This lack of equality is found in gender, sexuality, race, disability, education, age. I'm sure I've missed many there in many, many places and in both subtle and straightforward ways. Consider for a moment that statistics indicate that one in four women will be violently attacked by a partner. Consider that some elected representatives blame flooding and natural disasters on same-sex marriage. Consider the racism suffered by refugees, the lack of understanding around mental health, the fact that in many areas of the country, the minimum wage is not a living wage. Does this indicate that we are living in an equal society? Let me use the feminist movement just for a moment to demonstrate how different people can use the same word but mean something different. One woman can say that equality is about her as an individual, her equal worth to anybody else. Yet another, that equality must be firmly based in a community, in a group. Someone can say that equality is about equal choices, a free choice to return to a 1950s lifestyle, should that be what you wish to do. Yet another, that equality is always progressive, always left-wing, always modern. This is not a straightforward concept. We use the same word, but we mean different things. I suspect that within Quakers, we probably believe that we have a shared understanding of equality. And I think that if we did think that, we would be wrong. We may talk about the same color, but the gulf between different shades can be immense. When you mean turquoise and I mean teal, then we're talking at cross purposes just as if we were discussing red and green. I have no desire to tell you what to think. These are just my thoughts. This is just my approach. It may be that it only works for me because all I have is my own perspective. But I want us to leave here, to leave all discussions about equality with more questions than answers. I want us to doubt the completeness of our gut reactions. I want us to break down prejudices and certainties we may have held, because black and white concepts rarely help us when talking about equality. Let's consider that we might be mistaken, because that's how we get to stand in someone else's shoes. But before we do that, and I'd like you to do something for me, you will have found three pieces of paper uh, handed to you as you came in, and that's because at three points during the lecture, I'm going to ask you to use your pieces of paper in some way, and this is the first time. Can you all take your yellow piece of paper, and can you, can you write on it one or two words, or possibly draw a very simple diagram of what equality means to you? Now, I'm not looking for a paragraph, but just one or two words. 
Something very simple. And I have the slide already. Thank you. When you've done that, just keep it safe, because I won't ask you to look at it for another 40 minutes or so. Thank you all. Although sometimes the myth may be greater than the fact, historically, Quakers have stood up for others. We've stood up for prisoners, we've stood up for slaves, we've stood up for women. Most recently, we have spoken out for, for same-sex marriage, for equal marriage. And yet, we have as many taboos as others. Class is a particular taboo that I find. We may not start from the same place, but we do tend to end up in the same social class. And more so than class, more taboo than that, are education and intelligence. The uneducated can be humiliated by the educated, made to feel that their lack of expertise about a particular subject, their lack of quickness in a particular way of thinking means that they are worth less. And this matters because education and class are two of the things which most go towards determining whether someone will be rich or poor. And what about intelligence? I feel bad talking about intelligence. On the one hand, it is not given equally to all. But on the other hand, intelligence can be no more than a measurement of what we in our society consider to be good. Mathematical ability, scientific ability, language and creativity, these are valued in our society. Manual dexterity is not so important. Physical prowess is not so important. And there are probably many other ways of being intelligent that we just don't think about. Having the right gifts, being born with the right skills and talents means power. So when we think about equality, let's think both about the diversity of humanity and the way in which society views these things. When I first started to think about this, then I asked myself a number of questions, quite a lot of questions. What does equality mean? How do we measure equality? What do we mean by equal choices? Do we mean starting from the same place? Do we mean ending up in the same place? When we have two competing groups with different needs, how can we treat them both equally? When we talk about equality, do we mean something which is absolutely equal for a particular factor or a broader sense of equal worth across multiple factors? When we say we want equality, do we actually mean something which is more equal rather than absolutely equal? In the same way that we call the night dark, even though it is not the absolute darkness found in the deepest caves. This lecture is clearly not long enough for all of these things, but I start with a number of ambiguities at the heart of equality. Ambiguities rather than conflicts, because it is often the case of choosing between two of these. Not absolutely, but saying it's a bit more that, it's a bit more this. They're not competing ideas always. The ambiguities I'm going to go through, they include uniformity, diversity, community, the individual. There's a little bit about expertise and elitism. There's something about leadership and loyalty. But I'm going to start with a quality of opportunity and a quality of outcome. Many people say that they want to give everybody real equality of opportunity. Is that possible? Can we do it? It's normally one opportunity at a time, and it might be that the thing you're being given a chance at is not something you're naturally talented at. You may have seen a cartoon of a group of animals sitting under a fruit tree. There's a rhino and a monkey and a lion and a snake and a giraffe. And the caption is, this is going to be a fair and equal test. You all have to climb that tree. Now, 
That's one opportunity, an opportunity. It's clearly not fair. It's worth nothing in terms of equality. One approach, a micromanaging approach, might be to give all of the animals different tasks, something particularly suited to their skills. But can't we just take a step back? What's the objective? Does it have to be any more complicated than you've all got to get some fruit? Somehow, when we talk about equality of opportunity, then it's always presented one opportunity at a time. And it seems to me that life isn't like that. I see life as being layers of opportunities, multiple opportunities, and the layers lie one on top of each other, like layers of acetates, transparent acetates, and drawn on these are thick black lines. Here's a layer of opportunities to do with poetry and words and language. Here's another one above it, which is to do with maths and uh, dexterity with numbers. Here's another one above that that's to do with sport and health and physical things. When you put all of these layers together, people don't manage to get through, not because they fail in all of them, or even most of them, but because too often the thick black lines of one lie over the open spaces of another. What seems like a clear, wide, open opportunity is limited by factors from outside of that particular opportunity. It's also the case that in order to succeed, you need to recognize what success means to the rest of society. You need A, the opportunity to arise. B, the ability to recognize that opportunity for what it is. And C, to be in a position to actually take that opportunity. That takes more than talent or skill. That takes luck. Luck that the particular opportunity that comes along is one which you can take, which will take you where you want to go at the right time. And luck is not equal. In order to start from a world where luck was equal, where the opportunities were equal, wouldn't we have to start from one where the outcomes were already the same, where we were all the same? Furthermore, what we think of as being a quality of opportunity is colored by our aspirations. It's shaped by our stereotypes. Do we think that by going into a girl's secondary school and saying, girls can be engineers too, we can overcome a decade or more of social stereotypes about what girls can or can't do? Some parents might say that because their daughter loves pink and sparkly things and hates maths, and because they never told her to be that way, that it must be innate. As if it didn't matter that so many adults said to her how pretty she looked, or how lovely she'd be if she had a pink toy. As if she didn't go into many toy shops and see the girls' toys being about pretty things, the boys' toys being about blowing things up, which is much more exciting. Studies show that when people are reminded of social stereotypes, they perform worse in tests. So in order to provide true equality of opportunity, we need to be able to provide equality of aspiration, equality of dreams. There's a question about opportunity and outcome which I haven't heard asked before, and it's this. Which type of equality is easier to achieve? Say you're the government, which can you actually do? Like water, the human spirit finds the easiest path. But unlike water, resistance can come from unexpected places, not least of all within. Wear it as long as thou canst, said George Fox of William Penn's sword. So what sort of equality is easiest to achieve? 
let's look at equality of opportunity. This narrows what is acceptable and known. It takes a small number of factors, chooses those factors, and says, these are what matter. This is what provides for differentiation. And, mer and merit is therefore defined as being able to excel at those particular factors, regardless of all the things which have been put aside. That's not what a quality of outcome does. A quality of outcome looks at the results. It pulls some people up, and in doing so, must push others down. It relies on other people in the way that equality of opportunity does not. And that's my answer. That equality of outcome is easier to achieve if you start from the assumption that the world is about groups, about other people, about communities. Do we think from that that people who believe in equality of outcome will naturally be drawn towards big state thoughts, big state politic, left-wing solutions. I think it's the other way around, that the political views come first, the views about equality come second. And I'm using political in quite a, a loose way here, a broad sense. I think that those who start from the belief that the world is about groups find it easier to achieve a quality of outcome. The easiest path is formed from what you already believe. The path of least resistance comes from your already existing political views. One friend said that his commitment to equality and his commitment to socialism came from the same place. For him, I'm sure that's the case. For others, a different political view, a different set of values, provide the seed to a different view of equality. The second ambiguity I want to highlight um, this is about the community and the individual. We are all members of communities. Communities are made up of people. When I think about equality first, then I think about it as being a person equal before the law. But is it actually that equality is a relative thing, that it requires two people to work? Is my worth equal to yours? And if so, on what level? the level of fundamental humanity or some particular skill that we're discussing. This matters because we can think about people in one of two ways. We can think about me as a woman or we can think about me as a member of the community of women. Discrimination takes more forms than the blatant and the obvious. And I have suffered sexism as a thousand paper cuts, not as a single heavy blow. When we bring together the everyday experiences of people, we can build a picture. We magnify what we know and feel but have difficulty articulating until the picture is clear enough for us to recognize. This is an example of how the personal can be part of the community and can be all the clearer for being viewed at the community level. The difficulty with thinking about equality just at the personal level is that discrimination is subtle and insidious. Prejudice means I have prejudged you, not on what you actually are, but on what I think you are based on communities you belong to, or that I think you belong to. The trouble with thinking about equality just in terms of communities is that people belong to multiple different communities, all with their own different values and views. Categorization masks rather than helps us to understand these complexities. It can also be difficult to work out where the edges of communities are, where one community stops and another one starts. And how do we know who's in which group? We might think we know sometimes, 
but what about all of those things which we are, which are hidden, which are not immediately obvious? How can we struggle against discrimination against groups if it's not clear who's included in each group? And we should also think about those who are on the edges, those who don't feel like they're part of any community. Perhaps they are the ones who are most excluded, who are most discriminated against. So there's an advantage to being in a community, a sense of solidarity, being in it together. But let me ask you this. How do we get to be in the community? Maybe it's something we're born with. We're part of a community because we happen to have a particular skill and we can't take it away from ourselves. Or maybe we choose to be part of that community. And if people switch communities, if, depending on their abilities, their skills, the opportunities they take, people move communities, does the resulting flexibility damage the stability of groups? Is equality of opportunity based on merit sustainable over multiple generations? So I've already touched on the third of the ambiguities I want to discuss, diversity and uniformity. The fact that we are born different, we persist in not being the same, that's what causes so many of the problems for equality. Just as opportunities should perhaps be fair rather than equal sometimes, what about outcomes? But in order to make that the case, we'd have to all be the same. And what sort of diverse population wants to live in the same houses, wear the same clothes, eat the same food, when they have such different tastes? There may also be an advantage to being different. The best teams, the most efficient and effective teams, tend to be diverse teams. There are some tasks, like putting up a tent, which simply require two bodies. And it may be easier to do that with a clone of myself than with another real human being. But most of the time, different opinions matter. New experiences bring new understandings. Different people play equally valuable roles. There's an assumption made by some that equality means absolute equality, uniformity. I think that's a mistake. These people are arguing against a straw man of an argument, whether they know it or not. Absolute equality on multiple factors, on all the factors at the same time, simply can't exist. There are too many factors. You keep finding something else to measure. How can we all be the same on absolutely everything all the time? Perhaps we should stop talking about equality like it's a singular thing. We should start talking about equalities in the plural. There are two more thoughts on ambiguities I want to raise with you. Not to say much about them, but to leave the thoughts here. The first has to do with expertise and elitism. Is it that there is such a thing as good music, good art, good literature? We all have our own tastes, but is there bad art out there? What is art? When we think of something which can be measured, such as sport, then some people are simply better at particular things. But how do we translate this to things like music? Does it not become elitism? But do those people simply know more about it? Can we be fooled by egalitarianism into accepting things of poorer quality? Do we want the things which nobody minds, the bland things? Or do we want the things which some people actually like and therefore some other people might dislike? Is there a value in minority tastes? Is there a value in that which stretches and challenges us? The second idea is around loyalty and leadership. 
Loyalty is built on bonds based on hierarchy and tribes. Whereas part of equality is surely saying, we will take you on your own merit, regardless of which group you belong to. So loyalty, loyalty to my group, right or wrong, does that ignore something important about equality? And if we have questions about loyalty, what about leadership? What about power? Who has the power? Who doesn't have the power? What relationship does this have to ability? Because equal in the sight of God does not mean the equal ability to assume responsibility. And if we are to recognize the diverse range of skills which those in our community have, then we should recognize that some of those lie in leadership. So far, this has been about the ambiguities at the heart of equality. But I want to take a step backwards. How did we come to the conclusion that equality is good? Why is equality good? I'm going to ask you to answer that. Can you take out your blue piece of paper, but don't start writing on it yet, because I am going to time you. I'd like to give you two minutes to write or to draw, and I want you to keep your pen moving for the entire two minutes. Just let everything come out. Doesn't matter if you think you're waffling, doesn't matter if you're writing the same thoughts over and over again. What I want you to do is sort of take your thoughts from your head, through your hands, right onto the paper. Perhaps you might be surprised what comes out. Are you ready? Can you start now? Friends, I'm afraid the two minutes is over. It goes very quickly. <laughs> Just take a quick look back over that. Is there anything there which surprises you? Are your second and third thoughts different from your first thoughts? Perhaps you can talk about this with other friends once this is over, because it's quite an interesting exercise to do. When I asked other friends this same question, then I received quite a range of different answers. Some said, some approached it from a moral angle. They said that equality was good simply because it was the recognition of the fact that we are all equal, that there is a fundamental equality, that everyone has the ability to contribute to society. And so inequality is a distorting of this, a moving away from love and compassion Spiritual equality is more than just a recognition of that which is good, more than just a recognition of the fact that we all have gifts to share, spirit-given gifts. Throughout history, how many people were told that they couldn't do something, that it wasn't for them because of their gender, because of their race? How many people are told that now? that they must put all of their effort into doing something that isn't what they want to do, put all of their effort into being someone someone else wants them to be. How is that good for them? How is that good for society as a whole? And how is it good for society to have a narrow view of what human beings ought to be good at? Sometimes I think that so many of our systems, our welfare system in particular, is based on an assumption that people ought to be good at something, and that when they are not, they have failed at being human, and therefore shouldn't be treated as such. How is that kind of thought good for society? On the one hand, a society which pits people against each other functions less well than one which operates as one nation. On the other hand, a society which keeps people firmly in their places, 
stifles creativity, stifles big ideas, but does so in the name of maintaining stability. But a society like ours, one which says that everybody can achieve social mobility, which offers vast rewards for a narrowly defined set of skills and then rebukes those who don't fit that exact mold as not being good enough. That is a society which is eaten away with bitterness and strangling itself out of spite. Because being unequal does remarkable things to society. Many of you will have read The Spirit Level, um, the, book, uh, the book by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, and you will have seen the conclusions that equal societies do better, that an unequal, so that an unequal society is more crime-ridden, less healthy, more stressed. The shocking thing is that these conclusions are both surprising and absolutely expected that what it tells us is something we've always known. Equality is better for all, not because from behind the veil of ignorance you don't know whether you're going to be rich or poor, but because equality is better for both the rich and the poor. Equality is about the equal ability to make a contribution to society. Within all of this, we have an understanding of equality, both, of a, both as a cold technical measurement and something about fairness and justice. Giving everybody exactly the same doesn't work because we're not born with the same bodies or the same minds. Nature doesn't give us exactly the same. But the consequence of not thinking these things through, not considering it, that must be a dysfunctional, heartless, inefficient society. What are the consequences? That's something I asked myself. Do we consider the consequences? When we advocate for whatever type of equality we, um, that we support, do we actually consider the consequences of it? Do we follow the rabbit hole all the way to the end? The medium wage for the UK for full and part-time work is about £23,000. My wage is above that. If I say that I believe in a more equal distribution of wealth, to what extent am I prepared to give up the privileges I currently have? I don't know, but I do know that I'm not the only one who's avoiding the question. Let's also consider some of the other consequences. If I say that ability should determine where somebody ends up, then I'm accepting that I could go down as well as up. And unless I believe in the inherent worth, the inherent value of my particular skills against some objective external list somewhere, I'm also accepting that ability is as valued by the community and the list of skills currently prized may change. So when we think about these things, do we think through the consequences? Or do we leave them half considered, half explored? Talking through ideas with others makes us less extreme in our own political views. You may have had the experience of speaking to someone who dislikes all people on benefits, except one or two people they know, because those people really deserve it. Those people are not like the stereotypes. They're not like the people that they've read about in the papers. They're not like the people they've heard about on the radio. And you think maybe if they met a few more people like that, then they'd realize that stereotypes are not always right. It's not just about those who are socially conservative. My former partner used to work for the Ministry of Defense, and I simply avoided talking about where he worked. But meeting people makes us realize that they're not monsters. 
Meeting people makes us realize that they have different views and different values, and sometimes some of those are valid. There's a similarity between seeing where, well, seeing where other people are coming from and thinking about where we ourselves come from. Friends, so many of us are born with so much privilege. I know that I am born with a fair amount of privilege. The mentality of privilege seeps through, making life easier for some in ways which are never even realized, while for others, the memory of hunger colors each moment with a distant fear. Our everyday realities are shaped by how we see others and how others see us. And so privilege begets luck while despair gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Check your privilege against the objects which mark out class. It's not always the case that conspicuous consumption means wealth. Sometimes I think that my testimony to simplicity becomes either an adherence to the John Lewis list or a hair shirt. Two years ago at Yearly Meeting in London, we discussed how the distribution of wealth can divide us. I didn't hear mention of the different values which were placed upon blue-collar and white-collar jobs. And the only mention of class I heard was from a teenage friend. The rest of us spoke about the system spoke about poverty, spoke about capitalism, the big picture. But only a teenage friend said the word class. And I know that the class system gives me enormous privilege. So if we're the privileged, then who are those who are least privileged? Who are those who are most discriminated against? The homeless are obviously very underprivileged. It seems that not having a home means not having a place in our hearts, and we see them on the streets and too often step over them. Refugees are demonized as liars and cheats who would do anything to get into this country. Seemingly, it seems to languish in detention centers. There is a serious lack of understanding around mental health issues, around health issues in general. And those who do not fit into our communities, who have different histories, gypsies and travelers, for example, are feared and mocked. Saying someone is less than human removes the need to understand them. And those degrees of dehumanization get into the conversation. This is less about rights denied or privileges withheld than wanting to be acknowledged as a moral, responsible human being. That was something that Lucretia Mott, the American campaigner for suffrage and against slavery, said more than 150 years ago. Those who are born with certain characteristics, with certain chances, certain set of circumstances, have the ability to discriminate against others. Prejudice is power, a way to crush others with customs that they don't understand, a way to bind others up with laws which they can't overturn. And so we should all recognize that how we view the world is bound up with our own personal norms. And sometimes it may be clouded with privilege. This is a concern because equality is one of our testimonies. And if we don't know what we mean by it, how can we act on it? And if we don't know what others mean by it, then how can we talk to them about it? To understand something is not to put it in a glass case and treat it like an antiquity, but to explore it, to pull it apart, to turn it over, to study it, to put it back together, to help it to evolve. J.W. Roundtree said that the doctrine of the inward light upon which the tongue trips so lightly requires searching elucidation. 
I would add to that beautiful phrase that even the most powerful truths become self-evident both through external events and through inward contemplation. And we have a history to share. We can lead by example. George Fox laughed at the suggestion that women had no more souls than geese. The power and the spirit of God gives liberty to all, he said, and he meant all. The fundamental equality of all makes us powerful. However, sometimes we forget that we're not all the same. Sometimes we forget that we live in our own little bubbles and not everyone is exactly like us. Sometimes we forget that our community feels safe, not because there is no challenge, but because we challenge in love. And that's what faith communities bring. Faith communities bring a measurement of human value which is measured in the human spirit rather than one which is based on how much someone owns, how much someone earns, how much power someone wields. Our testimonies are testimonies of value, and they cut across secular definitions. We all contain a little sliver of the divine, but because we are all different, then it's in a different place in each of us. The next question is how. How do we reach a more equal state? If privilege is embedded in the system, how can we struggle against stereotypes? Well, can you take out your pink piece of card, please? And can you write down two things on it? Firstly, something which is not equal and you think should be more equal. And secondly, what can change? What can be done? Thank you, friends. These times are never quite long enough, are they? Saying something must be done is a thousand times more effective if you can also say what it is that should be done and how it can be done. Speaking truth to power can, e can quickly turn into empty assertion unless you also come up with plans and ideas and suggestions. Speaking truth to power is often less effective than discussing truth with power. And I would caution against the suggestion that we simply ask our elected representatives to bring us equality. Equality is difficult to balance. I'm certain of that if I'm certain of anything. And it's easy to mistake. Too many people think they know exactly what equality looks, for, looks like for everyone. And furthermore, I'm not sure it is the type of thing which can be imposed, which can be demanded. I think it's a process, and I'm not sure you can demand a process. There's no panacea. There's no easy and simple and quick way to get to a more equal society. But just because there's no easy way, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. This is a call for all of us to speak to a vision of more, to speak to a vision of a more equal society, to strive for it, to work for it, to never give it up as lost, to dream of it. This is not the naive suggestion that everything is good, but the ability to see that which is good in every circumstance. Nor is it a call for a uniform world nor a perfect world. Small differences can be the grit that becomes the pearl, but large inequalities drown all of us. Real change comes slowly and over time, and we must not be afraid of acting cautiously. To act cautiously is not quietism, not inaction, Radical change over a non-radical period of time. Consider the discussion around sexuality, the discussion around same-sex marriage. Every step was a single step 
but the goal was achieved in fewer years because every step was also a step forwards. So to act cautiously can be to build a base from which to reach yet further and higher. The way we treat people and want to be treated, we want to be treated in a fair way. And we're not just acting on instinct. We have a socially developed sense of fairness and justice, one which comes out of us being a community. And because it arises from us being social creatures, we can change it. We can slowly change our cultural norms. But if we seek to do this, we must also make sure that we take everyone with us that it's not just for a small group of people. Remember the catchphrase, nothing about me without me. And for me, this points even more towards social change, social campaigns as a way of affecting change rather than legislation. Because for me, to have somebody with experiences a million miles away from mine who knows nothing about me, passing laws about me which I have no say in, as if I was some weaker sort of human being, that seems like a misuse of privilege. My thought is that a legal framework serves to uphold um, the values which are already conferred by society, that only rarely can it create an acceptance which is not to a large extent already present. And so that is where I direct my efforts. That's, where, that's what I think about the social change, because tradition can be strong. Tradition can be malicious, and so too can ignorance. Our shared sense of fairness tells us that hard work should be rewarded, but not that vast treasures should be given to the very few. This isn't a call for there to be prizes for all, but there should be more than one prize because the skills needed for the egg and spoon race are different for the skills needed for the three-legged race. We should widen our sense of what should be rewarded, widen our sense of what is valuable, what in society we think is good. Let's value diversity and let's build and support structures and institutions which also value diversity. So what is equality? Now I'm coming to the end of this and I want to leave you with a few thoughts. This is not necessarily something that I ask you to accept or to agree with, but to consider, maybe to question yourself. Many people think of equality like a principle like a rock in a sea of changing truths. But I think of equality as a process. This is the recognition that a diverse community requires a flexible approach, that uniform love and respect can manifest itself in as many ways as there are people to be loved and respected. This means providing the opportunities and refusing to judge on the outcomes, while every outcome opens up a new opportunity, and every opportunity is a way to get to a different outcome. It's nothing without fairness and justice, and it's also nothing without freedom and the ability to make our own choices. We should stop thinking of equality like it's a measurement of isolated events. Equality is wider than that. This isn't about who wins the 100 meters race, or the egg and spoon race, or the three-legged race, but about seeing all of the races together as one sporting event. Discrimination is when we concentrate on one and ignore all the others. So when we think about equality, Let's recognize the wider context. Let's recognize the broad and compound nature of life. The fact that change comes slowly is not a problem. We're at the start of an avalanche when only the small stones are falling, and we must put all of our effort into ensuring that the boulders come in the generations after ours. And we must keep talking. 
Nobody owns the meaning of the word equality. The beauty of language is that different values, different views color and deepen the meaning of words. To talk about how and why we differ can be to start a respectful conversation. But to ask somebody to put aside their own carefully considered view, that is a misuse of power. Right at the start of this talk, I asked you to use your yellow piece of paper to, um, to express what equality meant for you. Can you just take a quick look at it again now? Do you think that it means that still? Do you think that the people sitting next to you wrote the same thing? Do you think that I should have asked a different question? Please, once this is over, do talk to others. Think about it a bit more. Come and talk to me during the group's fair tomorrow, the group's fair on Wednesday as well. And when you leave this lecture, then I'd be very grateful if you could leave some of your cards by the door. There are baskets there. Perhaps not all of them. Perhaps you want to take them away and leave them with me tomorrow at the group's fair. But if a few of you could leave them, that would be absolutely fantastic. This evening, I've given you some of my thoughts, but I haven't finished thinking. I'm really not done thinking. I, like you, I hope, leave here with more questions than answers in that state of carefully considered uncertainty, which for me lies right at the heart of being and opens up the doors of the spirit to exploration, to knowledge, and to faith.